morning. Thank you for being here in this talk today. Thank you, Ricardo, and the organizer for the conference. Looking really good. Um, I'm Christian. My colleague is Oliver. We are going to talk about how we approach uh, security visibility in a high growth environment. That is a sky scanner. A little bit of background about us. Um, uh, I'm the head of product security in Skyscanner. Se product security is the squad that look after security engineering. Uh, our focus is uh, the architecture, the platform, and all the software. This is pretty wide. Um, previous Skyscanner, I was working at uh, Microsoft, at Skype, as a lead uh, security engineer. And before that, practice lead in the Bryson business for uh, Europe and Asia. Um, Half of my career is offensive security, so I was doing security testing, penetration testing, hacking, breaking into companies, and my second half of my career is defending companies, so on the other side of the fence. So, Oliver? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name's Oliver Crawford. Um, I'm a software engineer in the product security squad, along with uh, Chris. I've uh, been at Skyscanner now for uh, eight months. Um, before that, I just graduated last summer out of university with a BA in computer science. Uh, I did some research last year in some graph databases, but now I'm more focused on the security side. Before we go ahead, we want to set up a little bit of context to understand what are the challenges and the, the problems that we have as a security team. Um, how many of in the audience know Skyscanner? If you can raise your hand. Okay, really good. So Skyscanner is a meta search uh, that helps travelers to find the best deals on flights, hotels, car hire, and trains now. It was founded in 2003, so that is important. It's a long time ago. Uh, we are over 900 employees distributed in 10 global offices, Barcelona being one of them. Um, we have an average of 60 million unique monthly visitors and more than 70 million downloaded apps. Um, in 2015, the total gross of booking was 11 billion. And that is kind of a little bit of background about the company, the size and the volume of things that we are handling. On the engineering side, we've been embarked in a journey on going into containerization and continuous integration a year and a half ago. At this moment of the journey, we are around 25,000 builds per month. We have more than 500 distinct services running in production. But it's the beginning of the journey. Our goal is to have to be able to make 10,000 changes a day to production in zero clicks. So that has certain security challenges, or at least for, for, the, for our team. Um, we are also transitioning from the, the data centers into the cloud. The company started in 2003. There was no cloud back then. So uh, we are in a hybrid world at the moment. We have a pretty diverse technology stack that we've been collecting through the years by acquisitions or by teams choosing the, the technology for doing the jobs they needed to do. And we were pretty lax and open on letting everyone to use the technology they want as, as long as they can go fast. But when you start growing, that it starts being a complication. So we decided to standardize the technologies. And we have the, the official technologies currently in the company are Java, Python, and Node. As Javier um, presented yesterday, for all those technologies we provide tooling, automation, we have a cookie cutting template so developers can quickly uh, create a service with a, with a template. Uh, the template will provide all the tooling, the health check monitoring, security, et cetera, et cetera. So all the efforts on aut automation and standardization is on those three technologies. But still, we have others. We still have around .NET, Windows environments, PHP. Ruby stuff like we've been working in the past. So that having so many technologies is a problem for security because it's not the same to implement security static code analyzer in Java 
and do all the teamwork and the effort to get that than to do it for five different languages. Because the tool, tools are different, it's not the same tool, so you have to end up having a maintaining and running a five different security scanner or two different security scanner, which is complex. All these standards and central system, when I say central system, is like the pipeline, all, all, all the supporting platform is not fully adopted by every team. There are, it's, a, it's a big per percentage, but it's still not everyone is using all these toolings. There, is, there was a lack of centralized catalog. How many of you in your company have a service catalog or a system catalog that you can go there, query, show me all the PHP services that are running in production now? Good. OK. We are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> this is very important for us. For security, it's like, OK, I want to know what we are running, but where, where is the, the catalog? There's no catalog. Okay. So how we, do we know which all the services that we have? Uh, you have to, well, there are ways to sort of know the one in AWS. You can go to the data center and do this. So it's, where, it's not a central place that you can use to take decision, filter stuff, and uh, work with it. But we are heavily working now as a company to get this. So it's priority now in our uh, tribe to get this done. And as uh, Oliver mentioned, the security engineering team was uh, uh, formed almost a, a year ago. I joined the company a year ago, and we started hiring and building the whole team. So we've been doing all the things that are, we are talking today while building the team that we are now. So it was a fast and furious <laughs> process. And one of the biggest challenges at least for someone new in this uh, kind of uh, uh, company that use uh, the organizational structure was, it, it, for me, was the, the very, very, very well, that was a difficult point to, to get the handle of, right? We have a squalification. Uh, I don't know how many of you are in a squalified model in your companies, but uh, as Javier mentioned yesterday, we have uh, groups that are the, the biggest uh, grouping category. The, the, inside the group, you have tribes, and inside the tribe, you have the squads. You can see here we have two tribes, and then four squads per, per, per tribe. Um, this allows the, the, the teams to be independent, to be autonomous, to the, that coupled with the engineering principles that we have, like uh, fail fast, learn fast, um, lean principle, fast iteration, deliver, let us deliver quick to the, to deliver value quick to the, to the travelers. Um, obviously, in an ideal world, you're expecting, okay, it would be good to have one security guy per squad. Obviously, that would be impossible. You have, we have 75 squads at the moment. You won't, nobody uh, have one security engineer per squad. There's only, we are trying a model that lets us scale that is called the security champion model. So basically we choose, or we get one person interested in each squad that will be the point of contact for security. We provide training, we have meetings with them, they kind of understand the tool in the standards and they can escalate, scale, escalate um, security question to us and then we get involved with the ones that need uh, our help. So when I saw all that, I started thinking, well, this is going to be more difficult than herding cats. This picture of herding cats was cute, but this is more what was going in my, my head. The squads delivering services, processes, uh, system very quickly, and as long as you are talking with one and you kind of uh, do a resign review, there are other five or 10 going faster than that team, and when you move around, it's like it's impossible to get that um, track of what's going on, and it's very difficult to prioritize the work, what we need to prioritize as security. Someone told me to keep calm and do DevOps, but in reality, that was me at the beginning. But it, it was good because I like challenges. That was a very nice challenge for us as a, as a security team. It's something that is 
not many tooling around to be to do to solve this. So it's a interesting problem to have, and let's try to to fix it, or let's try to find a way that it works for us. So we define our strategy, and part of our strategy was the main focus was to shift security to the left. When I joined the company, there was a very small security team that were doing everything, like corporate security, network security, and uh, for the engineering part of the company, that is what we produce, the, the services, was focused on the last uh, two phases of the software development life cycle, on release and response. So we have bug bounties, the, the, the uh, set for to find vulnerabilities on the services that are put in production, and then incident response. Those are were the two areas that we had focused before. So part of our strategy was to move security to the left and embed security then in every phase of the development life cycle. Um, we want to provide guardrails. We don't want to be blockers. Uh, security is usually um, related with blocking, like, oh, security is coming. And now they're they going to start asking questions. They're not going to let us release. That we are going to have problems. So we don't want that. We don't want to shock the culture. So we, the, the, we have a culture of innovation, um, velocity, agility. We don't want to uh, affect that. So we want people to see us as enablers. So we are providing things and helping you to, to build um, better services. We, I haven't mentioned, but we also have our, one of the engineering principles is that you build it, you run it. That means that you also secure it because it's your responsibility. Uh, having a security team doesn't mean that the security is now delegated to someone in the company. It still is the, 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 the squad responsibility. I, I'm, there is something very uh, important of shifting security to the left. It's the cost. You save a lot of money. Any have an idea of how much more expensive it is to fix a vulnerability in production than fixing it at design or requirement? Any rough guess? Anyone? No? Okay. It's 30 times more expensive to fix a vulnerability in production than to fix it in the requirements phase. And it's supposedly when 25 more times expensive than doing it at the SDLC or, or the coding phase. So it's a lot of money. When you, when you think, it's not that you just think about big vulnerabilities, complex things to fix. Why, when it's found in, in production, you end up having incident response teams, the, a couple of teams involved, all managers, escalation meetings. So it's all that people's time that goes into, into the cost. OK, so if we are going to shift security to the left, and if we consider a, a skyscanner service having all these layers, which is design, code, the third-party dependencies that we include in our service, the Docker images for hosting the, well, holding the, the, the service, and the platform the, that is AWS, we can have the, uh, a pyramid like this. And for, so for each of these phases, we did the stuff. For the design phase, we define a thread modeling process, a methodology. We created the documentation, training, templates, and we targeted the more critical services in the company that were the ones dealing with personal data, with payments, or with booking uh, flows. We also created a security standard that is part of the production standard, so in, uh, um, when engineers uh, want to release a, a service, there are standards for production, they are about performance, one is about security, and those are still, the standards are there, it's a document, they are in the form of uh, user stories, so we, we create it in a way that the developers can consume them, but it still is a document, so it's not something that everyone goes and checks every time they are building something new. It, it, so we're trying to make it more aligned with the threat modeling and to automate those as much as we can, but that's, in the future. So now that we have the design, we have the code. When the developers start implementing the design, we wanted to introduce security at that phase. 
So uh, there was another squad in the company that were running uh, SonarCube for quality, and we decided to leverage SonarCube for security uh, because we wanted to implement as many things as we can quickly and go in to evaluate different static code analyzers, talking with vendors, having meetings, sales meetings. It will take a month. And I had experience in the past, and I tried many of them, and I thought SonarCube can do. The problem is SonarCube doesn't have many security rules or plugins. It has one for Java that is pretty good, that is finds find sec bugs, that is pretty well known and mature. So Java is covered. And then we had to find uh, plugins for Python and Node that were the other standards languages that were official. So we built a plugin for Python based on Bandit, that is an open source Python static code analyzer from OpenStack. We take all the rules and create our own plugin for SonarCube. And for Node.js, we also took the rule set from multiple open source projects and created our own for SonarCube. We also created a secret scanner for every language for Java, Python, and Node. And we created SonarLint plugins so people can have this static code analysis in the IDEs. So to get the uh, feedback as they type faster. So also the faster we, the more that we can shift to the left, the faster we provide feedback to the developer, the developer lose, uh, waste less time fixing the problems, and also they can learn while they, the, while they code. Um, so we have the code cover. Then usually when you create a service and start coding, you start using third-party libraries, open source components, everyone does that. And you know that I don't know if you know that, but it's the security people is, at the moment, one of the top problems into the companies is introducing vulnerabilities by using third-party software, because you usually include the, the, the libraries, but you don't care about the, the, the security. You don't know if they have security vulnerabilities, or if they fix a vulnerability. Many, most of the people don't act, uh, update the libraries in their code, so it's quite one of the most dangerous things currently, and that's how a couple of the latest data breach will happen because of third-party libraries being vulnerable. So we are using a SNIC, SNIC.io, and a SNIC basically scan our dependencies at build time and also in, on merge request, and a SNIC will store the, the dependencies in their database, and in the future when a vulnerability also is found in those projects, it will let us know, hey, you have five projects using this library that now has a vulnerability. Okay, so we can get the, we, we, we are alert and notice as soon as the vulnerabilities are found. So libraries cover. Docker, for Docker, we went for with Claire. We are scanning the images with Claire. Also, we have our own uh, official scanner images for all the different languages that we maintain and are, uh, are the ones that everyone's supposed to be using. And then we run, all the, all the official images through Claire, and also all the images that are being run in production through Claire. We cover Docker, and finally, uh, we are working in the pipeline now on creating this tool that is called a CloudFormation Reaper, that is a, a CloudFormation security linter, that basically we define the security rules that we want to detect in, in CloudFormation, and the pipeline will well, block the ones that are not uh, compliant. So now, that's great. We have a ser all, the, all the layers covered with tooling. We have results for multiple sources now, which is really good. We have a lot of things that we didn't have before. We also have stuff like backcrow, that is the back bounty pen testing. So we have and Jira issues that we detect manually while we're doing re uh, um, reviews. It's, it's a lot, right? It's, it's great. but. Is not enough because we have a, each of these services, each of these uh, tools have a lot of results. And if you consider that you have services from a long time ago and you have hundreds of services and thousands of repositories like we do, like we have over 4,000 repositories, where do you focus? Where do you, what, what do you prioritize? Is this service that has a lot of vulnerability? more important than that this one. Maybe that service is a test service. Someone created it's not in production, it just was created one time. Or this one that is really in production on the internet, but we didn't have that. So 
what do we need or what, what do we want? So we want to have a consolidated overview of the security of our services that let us take decision by a risk core. That's what we want. When we were talking with Oliver and Alex and Javier, we said, what do we want? That is kind of, yeah, if I can ask what I want, is that. OK, that was kind of the idea that we started with. The other thing is, what do we need? Situational awareness. How, anyone familiar with situational, situational awareness know what it is? You can kind of guess what it is. But it's the understanding of the environment critical to decision makers in complex and dynamic areas. It fits perfectly with our problem. So uh, we need to increase our situational awareness. Those guys are, doesn't, they are not be much aware, to be honest. That's how we felt. Uh, because we, you can protect what you don't, you don't know. If I don't know what I have or what, the, what it is, I can protect it. So that's why we came with the idea of creating a new service called Talos that Oliver is going to take over and continue explaining. All right, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, so we've sort of gone through like the security sort of challenges and the technical challenges that we're facing. And sort of the organizational ones as well to do with the, the squad and tribe structure that we have. And Javi yesterday sort of went over the sort of automation that we're including in our pipeline at the moment. But today we're going to talk more about how we're increasing visibility within the whole security framework that we have. And that was where the idea for Talos came in. It's uh, a new service that we've sort of been building over the last couple of months and I'm going to be sharing with you today. Talos is sort of from uh, Greek mythology. It was a giant automaton made of bronze to uh, protect Europa, which was in Crete uh, from sort of pirates and invaders at the time. So that's kind of where we got the analogy from before, you know, protecting us from Skyscanner, from all the hackers and bad people out there that want to take our data and stuff. Um, in its simplest form, it's kind of three separate parts. It's gathering data from all the security tools we have. Uh, it's doing some processing and mapping in the middle that we're going to talk about in detail a bit more. And it's forwarding that all along to a final sort of consolidated source that we have at the end. Um, and that's like brand new to us and is absolutely great for us because we just simply didn't have that before. Um, yeah, as I said, so these mapping functions were sort of linking the projects and services that we have um, to the squads and tribes uh, and the organization that we have. We sort of built it to be as simple and as extensible as possible. Uh, you know, there's always going to be sort of more security tools available. Uh, and there's a chance that we might have a complete reorg in the organization. And we'll have to change it and fix it. And we want to do that as quickly as possible so that visibility can come straight through to the other end. And as Chris did mention sort of briefly, uh, as a result of what we've done, we can now start having a risk scoring system for our projects. And this will help us aid our decisions decide how we're going to, which services we're going to sort of focus on, et cetera. Um, so yeah, uh, as I said, it's kind of three parts, collecting, processing, and forwarding. Um, so a bit more of the architecture of that. There's a Python microservice that we've built. It exposes some APIs. And then we have an AWS Lambda function that's sort of got some scheduled jobs running on it. And that's calling the service, getting the data, and forward it on. Um, we also have. Uh, like a DynamoDB in the middle, and that's storing all of our sort of mapping uh, and sort of data about the projects that we have. So it sort of tells us sort of source of truth almost, um, and we update that. And also, Talos will use data when it collects from the security tools that we have. And then we're forwarding and we're sending all of that to Elasticsearch. That's what we're using as our store, and we've got Kibana sitting on top of that. So as we saw from that last talk, we'll sort of show some Kibana later. Um, with some examples that we have. And that's allowed us to do sort of straight out of the box some dashboarding, um, some visualizations, metrics, and trends without having to do much to the front end, really. Um, so, sort of more of a sort of diagram point of view. So, we have sort of the plugins on the left and the right. So, we've got like the Jira, SNCC, Sonicube, uh, our Docker scanner. We're also scanning, so we have like a gateway for our public endpoints, um, and that gets us sort of features out of the box that go through gateways, such as uh, rate limiting, key authentication, and we can enforce that HTTPS is used only. So that's great, and we want services that are being publicly exposed to use that. We also track our Route 53 entries in AWS, and we're also looking at possible misconfigurations in databases 
on AWS, such as um, RDS, Redshift, and Elasticache. We're mapping all of that and collecting it. So the engine's sort of orchestrating it. Talos Lambda is sort of like actually calling it and making it run. So it runs uh, once every night, collects a sort of snapshot of what we have in that night. And then we can sort of look the next day and see what's happened and sort of map those trends. Mapping information with Dynamo and, as I said, sort of sending that to Kvala and Elasticsearch. Um, because it's quite a simple framework, it's like this is the design we've gone for, but you can sort of see how parts would be sort of interchangeable. You could choose different plugins depending on what your company uses. Maybe design your own front end, we, we may move to that. But as a sort of initial start, this was great for us. Um, you might think at this point, well, OK, you've got data from one place and you've put it in another place. That's like a, what, two-hour job? That's, that's, is that something to talk about? Well, that in itself is quite a trivial problem. But there is a non-trivial, more intractable problem that we've been trying to solve, and that's the actual mapping in the middle. How do we, you know, these sort of plugins that we have have no idea of the sort of squads and tribes in our organization. We need to provide it with that. And that's the sort of processing we have in the middle. So we provide these mapping functions that go from either projects or services to squads and tribes that we have. And we also do some other normalization of the data as well, because it's, you know, that's what we need to do. Um, sort of the key is, and there's no pun intended there, the key is as long as each plugin has some identifier that we can use and we can sort of extract out of it, we can send that to Talos, perform some mapping, and then we can begin to visualize it. So what exactly is the mapping and normalizing doing? Well, we have a, a great service that sort of records all of the projects that we have on our internal GitLab. It's sort of recording all the metadata about it. And we also have, uh, we have our continuous deployment tool called um, Slingshot, which is also recording some additional metadata for the projects that go through that. And we can use all of that. It's stored in one place. And it kind of acts as a plugin. We, uh, we call that plugin. We get information from it. And we're sort of putting it in this DynamoDB as our source of truth. Um, the reason we don't sort of call this directly as our source of truth, there's sort of two reasons. Uh, one is the data, as you'll see in a bit, is not great because a lot of it is manually inputted. Um, and secondly, it's just kind of a lot easier to have our own sort of data store and not rely on another service. So as I said, by polling this, we can create this database. Um, and then we, we do some further processing to fix manual errors, like spelling errors, common abbreviations of squads and tribes. That, again, I'll show. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, the, like, some metadata we're collecting as well um, is not just about the project and the squads and tribes, maybe like contact information, like a Slack channel, uh, a Jira project, an email address. And we can use that later on to possibly fix and remediate the errors that we have. So a good example of the sort of normalizing we have to do. So we have these sort of uh, four plugins. So Bug Crowd, Snick, Jira, and Sonicube. And just looking, if you want to look at the, say, the uh, severity of the vulnerability you're picking up, Bug Crowd uses a P1 to 4 system, where P1 is obviously the, like, the most critical. P4 is more informative. Snick, that's the last four levels. Snick is just three levels, high to low, quite simple. And then Jira and Sonicube, five levels, blocker, critical, major, minor, info. So even at this point, like for quite something quite simple, we have to do something. And I guess there's two options at this point. One is you can just sort of panic and just sort of send the data and sort of deal with it at the other end and sort of have an absolute nightmare of different numbers, different statistics, and try and manually sort of put this all together. But we don't want to do that. Um, we want to sort of filter and process it to our accepted values for severities for projects for squads. Um, and that's what we're doing. So we're mapping to our accepted values for severities. Um, in Jira, we can't exactly map to a project directly, but um, we can map it to a squad and tribe, which is really useful and gives us great visibility on that. And likewise, for this SNCC plugin as well, we actually can only get the name of a project, um, but we're using the sort of the full path of a GitLab um, project. So we need to perform some mapping from the name to the path, and we need to do that. Um, so sort of combining those last few slides into a bit more of a digestible diagram. Um, you can see the three tables that we have in DynamoDB. So we have like the name and service, uh, the name and service tables which sort of resolve to a project path. So we need to do that if it's like an AWS service, it's an AWS product. And then the project table has sort of fields that are quite useful, so squad and tribe, useful for the mapping. 
uh, Slack channel or some sort of Slack person and possibly an email address useful for alerting and remediating when we find the issues. And then we've got service class um, and like public. This is data we can collect that um, the service should have associated with it and the system catalog that Chris mentioned is hopefully going to even help that more. Um, and we can use that as well within our risk score calculation. So a project that is, say, public and is like a first class dependent, needs 24-7 support, uh, we're going to put that as like a higher risk value, obviously. Um, so on the right is an example of like a YAML file that uh, we use in our continuous deployment tool. Um, so that sort of manual entry input by, uh, by like a developer or whoever's running the service. Um, it also includes like a templated value as well. So survey this tool, which is sort of getting this data, putting it in this service that we poll, it's just going to take that template value and literally just give me the curly braces and the stuff like that, and that's not very useful. So we also have to call the tool itself, which exposes an API to sort of resolve that. So it's a, an additional sort of challenge for us, I guess you could say. Um, so we've done. We've done something. We've, we've got a lot more than we did have, um, uh, but could it be better? And the answer is yes, it could be a lot better. Um, obviously, it's a lot of manual input from the developer at this point, which is fine, but you know, it's not going to be 100% accurate. Um, project's going to change over time. So some sort of ways we're possibly going to look at this is um, uh, when a project is created, there's a new um, user command line tool, cookie cutter, I think we've mentioned. Um, so within that, we could shift the validation to the left as much as possible. So when you add the squad and tribe information, we can sort of perform some validation at that point, uh, and that'd be great. Or we can use this system catalog, which is going to be our proper single source of truth, and that will be able to propagate information throughout the whole company as it changes. We're going to sort of ask developers um, through just you know, communication blog posts, um, just reminding them on Slack, can you keep this information up to date? And it will sort of be a good positive feedback loop almost because we need them to update the information um, and that will help us and you know, we can help them. And it's, you know, it's just a great cycle really. Um, so you can sort of see more perturbation. So we have two squads, Data Tribe Clan A and Clan B. And you can sort of see the multiple different variations we've currently found in these files. Um, and before they just, that was fine, it was accepted. But as soon as we started this project, we realized it's actually a bit of a mess and a nightmare. So we have to, at the moment, sort of add these rules almost. Um, and obviously, it's like developers, I, I, I know myself, I'm definitely not going to write out developer enablement every time I want to create a new project. I just want to write DE, and that's completely acceptable. But we have to sort of map, map that across. Um, and that's the same for all our tribes and squads. And then you've got just sort of hilarious examples almost where a tribe has completely changed name to nothing it, it, it originally was and also like of spelling errors of modern and things like that and if we can't track that then we sort of lose the visibility completely um, so now on to what we actually sort of produced as the end result um, this is uh, a sort of screenshot from uh, the cabana which is where we're sort of visualizing the data at the moment uh, this is sort of the main dashboards, and so it's like obviously a lot of information on it, we've decided that the main one just should show all the information that we've collected at the moment. So we can see the, the 4,200 odd projects there are in Surveyor, not necessarily all of them are important to us or relevant or maybe being used. So we have some more metrics such as those that are in production, and we also want to track those services that are sort of adopting these tools that we are sort of introducing to developers and want them to use. These sort of projects, Squad and Tribe, they are also links in Kibana, as you like, as saw in the earlier talk. So we can click that, and you'll be shown a new dashboard um, just for that project, just for that squad, just for that tribe. And again, that's really useful. Um, we'll have a risk score column, which will sort of, at the moment, is quite a new feature that we've introduced. Um, it's going to be sort of using these fields, using other metadata that we've collected to sort of work out a score. And you know, that's great because we can sort of sort by that score and see the the riskier projects. Um, as we mentioned, Sonicube, our static code analyzer. For this, we're just focused on security. So we're just looking for the security vulnerabilities picked up by that tool. We're not necessarily interested in like, code quality that much. Um, whether they've got SNCC enabled, if so, how many vulnerabilities. Uh, we're looking, again, from Sonicube, it can report the code complexity and test coverage of a project. 
uh, which you know potentially could be very useful. Um, as I mentioned, gateway is something that, if it's publicly exposed, if we have a microservice with a publicly exposed API, we ideally want it going through gateway because we get so many security features just sort of out of the box, um, such as key authentication, um, rate limiting, as I mentioned earlier, and then the Docker image vulnerabilities. How many have we picked up in the scan? Um, and with, with, with Kibana, we obviously have the search field. So if we wanted to, we could specify this to an actual tribe. And you'll see the sort of uh, metrics change. And we're just showing projects now just for that one particular tribe, which is extremely useful. If we were to click on one of those projects, we'd see something a bit like this. Um, so now we've got a particular project, um, again, with the example of the risk score value we have. Um, if it's got like a Route 53 public entry that we can map and see, then we're interested in that because we know it's been exposed and people are probably going to try and attack it on you know, our bug crowd platform. So we don't want to be any glaring security issues with it. Um, so in this example, there's one SonicCube issue, uh, some sort of hard-coded secret that we don't really want in there. But you know, we probably wouldn't have seen that before unless we'd had to go onto SonicCube, go on through the console, et cetera. But now it's you know, quick and easy to see exactly where it is. If you scroll down on that page, you can then just see um, the number of like SNCC uh, libraries. So we're getting all the information in with the, the title of the issue, the package, the exact version that is out of date, and whether or not it's sort of upgradable or patchable. Um, and hooray, this project has no database vulnerabilities. Great. But if one did, it would show up in that table. Um, and then our Docker scanning tool, which was originally called Mr. Docker, but it's sort of integrated within Talos now. Um, and this is great. We can see the sort of image that it was using, uh, the base image that it sort of pulls from, um, the tags, and a very detailed description of the exact vulnerability that's being picked up by Claire. Um, you know, we can choose you know, lots of different designs, lots of different visualizations. Um, this is an example of our Docker image scanning uh, for all containers that are running in production at the moment um, with vulnerabilities. We can list all the images, and we can do lots of searching and lots of great things with that. Um, so because we're obviously mapping across squads and tribes, it's equally easy just to pick a squad, pick a tribe, and map across those. Um, so I've just got example names on here, but they're not too far away from what we actually have, to be honest. Um, and again, you can see the number of issues, number of vulnerabilities. Um, and this leads us to something that potentially could be really quite awesome, um, is like the gamification of security, something like we're definitely interested in, going to start. And it's definitely linked to the sort of culture uh, within Skyscanner. We sort of want sort of people to be really interested in security, really fascinated by it. And even starting out with something simple, like sending out a monthly report with the, re with the uh, data we've collected, and sort of doing that every month and seeing the trends and being squats within tribes, I imagine would get quite competitive with one another. Um, and you know, that's going to help us a lot. An example of a plugin, this is a Jira one. Um, and we've got some great stuff with this. So we can sort of record how quickly we're fixing vulnerabilities. And we compare that to industry averages that um, I think White Hat produced an annual report. And we've sort of used the collected data from across the tech industry with some sort of averages. And so we can sort of gamify ourselves almost um, and check that we're doing quite well. And also on here. Um, we can link directly to the Jira, Jira dashboard for that particular squad for tickets with a vulnerability label straight away. Um, and we've got all this information now. And you can have, obviously, a variety of diagrams, um, diagrams in Kibana, and you know, it's really useful for us. Um, there we go. Um, we're, picking, we're picking a snapshot um, every day, every night, uh, but obviously, We've been doing that for quite a while now, so we can even include trends, which is great. And we can see the trends on every day, how quickly it's going. Um, and you can see like certain events, obviously, where we've, we've, as a result of this tool, we've seen a sort of um, a ticket that's obviously not been done, and we've fixed it, which has pulled our average up. But then likewise, a new vulnerability has come in, and we've fixed it a lot quicker than before, and it's brought our average back down. And we can sort of map this, and that's perfect. Um, so we need an extensible solution. So the idea is uh, it's, lots of, it's quite simple plugins. I'm just going to show one now. And it's, this is great, because as soon as a new service becomes available, we want to track its adoption, we want to track its results. Um, so we just want this to be a quite a simple process. 
So sort of three steps. Um, you'll get a security tool, and that will have like a list of issues, probably some JSON, um, with the project, the vulnerability type, what exactly it is. Um, so we can take that data, and then we're going to do some processing, do some mapping, or otherwise known as magic, really. Um, we're going to do that, um, and we're going to sort of map it to a squad and a tribe. We're going to take whatever vulnerability levels out of it and scale that to what we want. And then we're just going to push that straight to Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, and then you can sort of see how we've called our Dynamo database. So project, red team, vulnerable project. Um, we've got the squad and the tribe out of it. We'll even add like a, some sort of additional data for us to go straight to the plugin, a time input. And we just send that to Elasticsearch. And obviously, we, it can deal with that. So what exactly does that look like? Well, I mean, it's quite a few simple steps. Just to call an API, you probably need some token and some parameters. Um, obviously, it might return a lot of stuff that we don't want. We just want the security data out of it. So we're going to get that. Um, and we're going to go through each issue, uh, format it as a sort of JSON string, and send that to Elasticsearch. Um, here you can see our mapping functions, get a squad tribe, get the project ID out of the JSON, get the squad and tribe, uh, get the severity. Um, and we're going to form this new past JSON object, which we're going to send to Gabbana. Um, and that, what that basically looked like is just a simple call to DynamoDB. Um, and we'll get in the squad and try out of it. So that's, that's where we've got to. Um, we've now got the visibility. We've now got that all in Talos, and that's great. But the next step really is how can we communicate that back to our engineers? So I'm going to hand back to Chris. He's going to talk about that. So now that we have all the data in one place, um, and how do we go back to the teams asking for fixes or how we can communicate this back? We can just basically create tons of Jira cards, which is not ideal because it's counterproductive. The Jira, the, all the cards will go to the back, it will die there, probably if you don't work, talk with the teams. So we decided to create a new service called Hermes. Uh, that is the, it's the messenger of the gods. Um, Hermes basically will query Talos, so it let us create simple queries like show me all the Docker images that are running this service that, are that have a critical vulnerability. And Hermes, uh, Talos will provide the, the list of Docker images, and then with the Hermes we can do uh, different, we have different options. We can use Slack to communicate with the teams, we can use Shira, or we can send emails. And that will let us to integrate the, all the, the, this, this tooling into our current workflow for vulnerability management. The, the, we have SLAs defined for the different severity types, so if we send it, we include it into Shira, we also, uh, teams can um, ask for extension of SLA if they need more time to fix it, or if the vulnerability can be fixed because it's going to be mitigated or it's going to be, let's say, uh, deprecated a service in a week time or a month time, and they can accept the risk. And we have all that workflow to go through Shira as well to get the sign off from a tribe lead uh, at that point. Also, another option that is something that we're going to use uh, a lot is CodeLift, that is something that Javier showed yesterday. This is a tool that will let us uh, send merge requests to the projects in an automated way. So we will, we will be able to do, use Hermes to get a set of Docker images that are vulnerable, and Hermes will, can, will be able to create a, uh, a merge request in those projects, upgrading the images, the Docker images, to the latest one that we consider that they have to be using. Um, and also, it will help us in the process of false positive elimination because we can uh, talk, or we, we can send back to the team so the team can validate if the vulnerability is valid or is it uh, false positive. This is an example of a message being sent by Hermes to via Slack. The basically, is telling the, the, the team that the project, uh, dummy cookie cat project, has the issue that uh, is using deprecated images, node 6, node 8, and Java vertex. Uh, has some notes and message to the team, and a couple of options, like accept the issue, postpone, development, and uh, abandon, and I don't, uh, no, uh, I don't own this. So depending on what the user click, 
uh, Hermes will do something uh, different in the back. It will send a shared ticket, it will send the merge request, it will, we have to work out what are we going to do with the ab abandon. Probably we have another team that deals with the, the project that need archiving, so probably we are going to feed on that service, so we are uh, this service needs to be archived, and then we'll have, we we'll continue to take it from there. So, now we have a, a new approach for, to solve a, a problem like this. Uh, we started with um, introducing a lot of security tooling. Then we created a service that will put all this together in one place. And then we have Hermes, that a service that can act on that data and then make the teams to action it and continue back into tooling again. So we can track everything now. And now we feel like the cats are more aligned, so we feel more confidence that we have an overview of what's going on. We can prioritize things. We, we, we have a better understanding of, 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 a, of our environment. And definitely, we increase our situational awareness that the shark is not anymore on the back. Now we have it in front of us, and we are prepared to take decisions on how to deal with the situations. So what's next? Um, this is part of our journey. It's this as we've been working eight months on all this. Um, we want to improve the mapping of all the services. Luckily, we have uh, this uh, system catalog on its way that will help a lot uh, our uh, the mapping of all the services with the tribes and the organizational structure. We are going to. We want to add the training information. We have an online uh, university for all the scanner employees, and we have a security track that covers multiple areas of the security. And we can get information about who did each training, if they did the quiz and they passed the kind of the final quiz. So we, we can have all the metrics from training, and also we can embed it into Trello, so we can see the tribes and the squads if they went over training, and depending on the vulnerabilities and the risk of the service, we can work with the team to get the training done and customize the training, so it will let us take those kind of decisions. Um, also, we are starting to discuss how can we use the risk score to take a decision on the pipeline, like blocking a, um, a release if the risk score is over X. So we are on the, at the beginning of that, those discussions. That's what we would like, because there will be certain uh, situations that need to be blocked, even if we don't want. And also, we are starting to block at least particular issues like secrets and stuff like that. So critical things that we know that are not false positives, we are going to start introducing certain blocks. So that's kind of our focus for the future. And, and that's it. That's our journey and how far we reach on, on obtaining visibility on a very dynamic and high growth environment. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the. Is it working? Yeah, yes. it's working. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. And uh, I have two questions. Yeah. First one is: um, Are you planning to open source at least some of the tools that you presented? Uh, we are. Yes. We are having discussions on how can we open source Talos because we think that we can make it. At the moment, it's a little bit tight in certain parts. So a lot of it is definitely uh, very open source, but as I sort of mentioned, it's very uh, sim simple and extendable. Just I think at the moment, because it's tied down to our organization quite a lot in the middle, so it'd be good to sort of open source that bit so that people, like all different organizations, could change that middle bit. But I mean, the, the front and back bit, yeah, it's relatively open source. Yeah. That's great to hear. And the second question is, uh, you just showed the visibility for um, application deployment. What about uh, the kind of the, the runtime logging and uh, monitoring your hosts or Docker, Docker images that are running? That's a different uh, project. It's, uh, we are. My team, the security engineering, is more focused on application level. So that we have another team that is security operations that will deal with all that part. So in the future, obviously, we can uh, um, join the, the two projects and put all the data in one place. But 
now we are focusing on what we are building in this with Talos. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we are running out of time, so sorry. Um, That's okay. You can grab those guys, I guess. Um, thank you. You can find them outside. Thank you, guys. Thank you for an excellent talk. Okay.